Though one of the newer entrants to the Dan Drew's institutional background and his emphasis on investor protections and wealth preservation, alongside getting good returns, make his platform First Real Fund really stand out in the crowd. Welcome to the National Real Estate Forum.org podcast, episode 236. Hey, thanks for joining me today. I'm Dr. Adam Gower, and this is the National Real Estate Forum.org, where I speak to leaders of the crowdfund real estate industry so you can learn how to raise capital, build wealth, and earn passive income from crowdfund real estate deals. Once you find a deal online that on its face looks interesting, there are two key components simply stated that you got to consider before wiring your money, right? One is due diligence on the deal, of course, to ensure that the sponsor's underwritten the deal thoroughly. And the second covers the offering documents that you will be expected to sign. In fact, these days, looking at the offering documents is where, where I start the process of due diligence. Naturally, Every deal that's put out looks fantastic, right? Because they're they're the sales pitch. It's what the sponsor wants you to see to encourage you to look deeper. Well, before even looking at the due diligence documents, I like to have a look at the offering documents to see if there's an alignment of interest between me and the sponsor. And in my conversation with Dan Drew at First Real Fund, it turns out that he has the exact same perspective very reassuring and actually coincides directly with conversations that I've had recently with three of the top attorneys in the country about this exact same question, what exactly to look for in the offering documents before you move forwards with an investment in a deal. In fact, I've produced a webcast that summarizes some of the key points from those conversations and you'll find that they tally almost exactly with the conversation actually that I have with points. Uh, from those conversations, and you'll find that they tally almost exactly with the conversation, actually, that I have with Dan today. Go to the show notes page at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash first real fund, and enroll at the top of that page for this free webcast. It probably has some of the most important information in it that you could possibly have when considering investing in real estate deals online. And it's also really consistent with the way that Dan Drew of First Real Fund sees the playing field. So do go ahead and check that out. It's absolutely fascinating. Both Dan and I have seen hundreds of deals go wrong from our perspectives in institutional investing and banking. And he doesn't see the world of real estate investment through rose-tinted glasses, as it's so easy to do. He's taken a very pragmatic approach to investing by not losing sight of investor to the terms in the offering documents. Really, do take a look at the webcast I put together on the same exact theme, totally coincidental timing, by registering using the link at the top of the show notes page at nreforum.org forward slash first real fund. You and I actually look like you and I went through some similar experiences during the last downturn. Well, that's... Uh, I was. That's exactly right. I'm I'm curious to chat with you about it, in fact. Yes. All right. Good. If it's okay, I, I want to ask you questions as well as we go along. I assume that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Actually, no one's done that. I, I, I have to give you a word of warning that my favorite subject is me. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I'm more than happy to answer any questions at length. <laughs> no problem. All right. So, look, Dan, I'm I'm really keen to learn a bit about you and who you are and what your background is, and what brought you to uh, First Real Fund. I'm really keen to learn a bit about you and who you are, and what your background is, and what brought you to uh, First Real Fund. How, you know, kind of give me the background, and how did you, how did you get there? I'm going to take you back a little ways, which, which is actually more than 20 years, if that's okay. Yes. All right. So my father is in commercial real estate, and when I first got my uh, driver's permit, I was driving around with him taking pictures of commercial real estate assets, specifically apartments. So that was my first sort of intro uh, to the world of commercial real estate. Out of college, I started working for a a lender that was primarily focused on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac debt. 
And I did that for the bulk of the start of my career, and I learned some very important lessons. But I was obviously exposed to uh, the intricacies of commercial real estate. And you know, with Fannie and Freddie, you're obviously really focused on multifamily. One of the things that Fannie Mae did that I thought was really smart is they have a risk loss sharing agreement with all of their DUS lenders. They're designated all of their DUS lenders. They're designated underwriter and, and servicing lenders, which gives them a certain amount of rights and responsibilities when it comes to who they make loans to and at what terms. And in exchange for having that responsibility, there is a risk loss sharing agreement. So Fannie Mae, to its credit, has created a structure where these lenders out there that are interacting with borrowers and dictating terms and doing the uh, the hard work of actually getting money out the door gave an incentive to these lenders to make sure that it was good money out the door. So it was an early lesson that I learned. And essentially, we were underwriting loans with an equity perspective. So that's how I got started. I did that in Chicago. I moved to Boston. In Boston, I continued that. I ultimately moved from Boston to New York. And one of the key reasons I moved from Boston to New York was I'm a Midwest kid. So being in New York was a really easy sort of transition where the diversity is is really, really broad. And I also had a nice crew of both personal. Do you know, are you familiar with Carlton? I am. Yes. Okay. But so I was able to expand from just doing multifamily debt to doing preferred equity and mezzanine debt and all asset classes and, and, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. So my um, opportunity to learn about other asset classes and other positions in the capital stack was kind of the focus. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with Carleton, I was there for four years. To, to Howard's credit, it's not an easy shop to, uh, to live on a day-to-day basis. It is, however, an exceptional place to learn a lot. So it's a trade-off that I was I was certainly willing to make, and I think other people have made. And, and, and Howard, you know, took his professional performance very, very seriously, and expected the same from his team. So it, it was an interesting time. And I was there. From when were you there? Actually, yeah, yeah, 2006 to 2010, which I, I you know, was a, a time of radical transition for all, virtually any commercial real estate executive, any commercial real estate executive. So it was interesting. I'd like to hear more is, about your your uh, evolution at, at that time. <laughs> All right. So, yes. So, uh, interestingly, actually, I was at East West Bank at that time, and I had this suspicion that we may have even communicated. If you were there from 2006 to 2007, I was at the bank from the end of 2008 to the beginning of 2010. And we, had, we came across Carlton for sure, and also Carlton alum at that Mm -hmm. time as well, who either left and went to other places. But you were, now what were you doing then? Were you doing uh, distress, you were doing notes, weren't you, at that time? So one of the great things about having a boss like Howard is he understands the mandatory evolution that's required. So we went from raising capital on fairly straightforward deals to attempting and successfully in certain instances trading distress payments and from raising capital on fairly straightforward deals to attempting and successfully in certain instances trading distressed paper. And I suspect that you, uh, you know, East West clearly had a balance sheet that probably had some changes in uh, asset management status. Yes, that would be a very (laughs) diplomatic way of saying it. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, my job was to find buyers for that, which is inevitably why I dealt with, with Carlton. But anyway, so after Carlton, how did you get to First Real Fund? So what, what was yeah. your career path then that got you to crowdfunding? So Carlton set me up with some expertise in the note trading space. And I got drafted to Cantor Fitzgerald, which is a large fixed income trading shop. They, they, they trade a lot of different things at Cantor Fitzgerald. But I was brought in and integrated a, a loan trading platform into their fixed income. So I sat next to some muni traders. I sat next to some CMBS traders, uh, high yield traders. And a lot of the clients, and we had our own universe of buyers as well. And, and it looks like you moved to Colony Capital. And you know what? There's a very reasonable yeah. chance that we overlapped while you were at Colony and I was at Cantor. We were probably calling you, hoping to sell some of the – the, either the loans on your balance sheet or loans that you guys had already acquired and could sell at, at a profit. Yes, that's also very possible. So I left, I actually left the bank and went to work for Goodwin Gore, who is Gore Capital and uh, Downtown Properties, a Hong Kong Chinese family office, I suppose. I think they're public in China. And with the fund that he set me up with, a, a $200 million note acquisition fund, I actually trundled over to Colony 
and tried to do some co-investing with them and ended up getting recruited actually by them to head up their divestments. They've bought around seven billion, mm -hmm. technically actually with the FDIC, I learned. It wasn't, mm -hmm. they didn't buy them from the FDIC. It was actually JVs that the FDIC, FDIC, FDIC was doing. Yeah, my job was to look at ways of uh, selling some of those re-performing notes, identify which re-performing notes we wanted to get rid of and uh, finding buyers for them. So typically, though, I was working with community banks, smaller community banks that wanted, once the market started to improve and the economy came back, they wanted to lend again and they started looking for borrowers and I was able to deliver 20 borrowers in one package. Right? I've got 20 loans, they're all re-performing, you can buy them at a close to par or slightly below par and tomorrow you've got 20 brand new customers so, but it was you know relatively small portfolios down they you know they weren't huge these were you know t kind of low tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, that i was selling to banks yeah very interesting so we uh, advised the, the, the fdic on some of those transactions and colony was such mm. a compelling bidder uh, for a lot of yeah. different reasons uh, but the fdic particularly was such mm. a compelling bidder uh, for a lot of yeah. different reasons, uh, but the FDIC put together a really interesting structure. And at the time, and you're, you've already pointed this out, there's a lot of different reasons to sell, you know, we would call it a piece of paper or, or a mortgage instrument to a buyer, right? There's a relationship there that maybe didn't exist prior. There is yield there that is probably above what's what currently existed. I mean, interest rates were, were significantly lower than what some of these loans when they were originated. So even paying right. par for a loan still meant a premium yield. Yes. Um, it was a great, great opportunity that forced all of us to learn not just what the value of real estate and collateral was, but how these positions are structured and, and how certain terms and conditions, whether it's a mortgage or a preferred equity position, might impact the long-term value and, and how it relates to the underlying collateral. So it was a, it was a very interesting and, and compelling time to be in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. It was indeed. Yes, it was. It, before I went into East West Bank, then I, I got a, you know, I really, I mean, I have a real PhD, but I felt like I got a PhD in, in banking. And then, of course, you know, working at Colony and dealing with thousands of loans, all of which had gone bad was in itself, in an extremely short period of time, was in itself uh, an incredible learning opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's actually, it's kind of part of that. I'd like to keep that in the backs of our minds as we start talking about the first real fund. And uh, how you, I, I'm guessing that you are probably as, you know, having the same kind of perspective, see the world through the same lens. Anyway, let's get to uh, First Real Fund. I'm really keen to understand what you do because you do, oh, the one thing that stood out on your website to me was co-invest. And that's not a term that you see on many of the sites. What was the origin of, or the genesis of me and my career and my willingness to and That's not a term that you see on many of the sites. What was the origin of, or the genesis of uh, First Real Fund? Here you are at Cancer Fitzgerald, wheeling and dealing, overpaying you know, for notes, <laughs> buying for me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> so, so, and, so uh, let me, so let me take you. So the, the, the reason, you know, it was an exciting time. It was those of us that adapted to the transition in the market and were able to provide a service that was relevant to what was currently happening was a really important lesson. And I think it was one of the key lessons for me in my career and my willingness to sort of take the step into commercial real estate crowdfunding, because I think it, this, what's going on in the private placement space on these crowdfunding platforms is still nation, but it does have similar characteristics to what has happened from 2008, 9, and 10, and then as the market stabilized into 2015. So that, that's how we got here. I mean, I, I was at Cantor Fitzgerald. I made the move to GE Capital because I thought – Fitzgerald, I made the move to GE Capital because I thought – it would be a nice, long-term, stable place to have a 20-year career, and GE Capital sold everything. So I was in, in and out at, at GE. So despite my move towards something that was maybe a little bit more longer-term and stable, it ultimately turned to be remarkably short-term. And you know, it was a reminder to uh, to not be afraid to to constantly adapt. And, and stability isn't necessarily a strength in, in anyone's career at, at any point in time. So I had to make the decision uh, after that at GE Capital, I had to decide, do I go back and get a more traditional role like I had, or do I go get a job that I think I'm going to want to have five years from now? And it was very evident to me, especially people in financial services, 
how important and how massive the fintech space not only is already, but is likely going to become over the next five and, and, and 10 years. So uh, with a, a little bit of time to think about it, it ultimately was a no-brainer. And I, and I think you've made a, a mirror step in establishing the, the National Real Estate Forum and understanding the potential in this space. So it was for a really long time. At Kenner Fitzgerald, I had to make a lot of phone calls and I had to establish a lot of relationships. And those two skill sets are actually particularly well suited to crowdfunding. There's a constant demand for underwriting and reviewing an awful lot of deals. The ability to quickly and efficiently select the ones that make the most sense and, are, and, and have a reasonable structure is, is a skill set that not everybody has. And it takes time and it takes generally seasoned executives to pull that off. And then you've also got to not only interact with these sponsors and borrowers, but there's a lot of investors out there, more than a traditional real estate deal, that are very curious. Some of them very, very sophisticated that have been doing this for a lot longer than I have. Some of them not not so sophisticated that need very complex ideas distilled into a relatively short and efficient answer. So it's it's kind of like the uh, the traditional teacher, right? Like until you really know something, you can't teach somebody. This is uh, an opportunity to to help other people learn about what we're trying to do, and it's an opportunity to, and it's an opportunity for me to learn from from people that have been doing this for even longer than I have. To find out what are some of the most important clauses to look for in real estate investment offering documents, go to the show notes page for today's podcast at nreforum.org forward slash first real fund and register for the free webcast where I summarize some lessons learned from conversations with three of the top real estate attorneys in the country. That's nreforum.org forward slash first real fund. Okay, so that's really interesting. So I do have a, a whole bunch of questions around those ideas. So let me dovetail them into understanding the genesis of the company, right? So what exactly did you do? You left GE and you heard of the Jobs Act and how did it all start? Yeah, so I went, I I decided that I wanted to get into real estate crowdfunding. I went and looked at the top real estate crowdfunding sites like a lot of people do. And how did it all start? Yeah, so I went, I I decided that I wanted to get into real estate crowdfunding. I went and looked at the top real estate crowdfunding sites like a lot of people do. Uh, and I went and tried to get a job and I ultimately did. Now, unfortunately, it ultimately didn't work out. And I had a series of clients and was given an opportunity. And I, I have a co-founder that had a really remarkable vision that coincided with mine as well. Uh, and I had the opportunity to start my own platform. And there were a few key things that we needed to resolve. And, and one of those is how do we differentiate ourselves in this market? It was a somewhat crowded market, but not terribly crowded with really qualified and competent players. Uh, but we wanted to distinguish ourselves. So it's what you mentioned before. How do, how do we, we, we need to make co-investments. And so I have a single source of capital that not not only understands commercial real estate and is an active investor throughout the world, not only in the United States, but in Australia as well, they are willing to, in certain instances, pre-fund these deals. They're willing to provide capital for co-investments. And they understand real estate. It's a flexible asset when it comes to na navigating the world of startups. All right. So what are the biggest challenges once you start? And when did you start, actually, uh, Dan? It's been a, you know, it's, it's been a little bit over a year. We've in, in, And I've been you know, active in, in private placements now for almost uh, two and a half, three years. So the biggest challenge is mm. is relevant to, to pretty much any startup, I think, and, and that is establishing the brand. It is, uh, from a macro perspective, something that is done by just the basic blocking and tackling every day, right? We're going to have our first capital raise pay off next month, and so the process of getting that deal funded, keeping regular updates going out, and then ultimately making the repayment, that's how you establish the brand. As, as inquiries come in, providing timely and inaccurate responses, that establishes the brand. Doing podcasts like this, making sure that articles go out, all that stuff is the is the day to day responsibilities of First Real Fund, and and that's how we establish the brand. So fortunately, our biggest problem Real Fund, and and that's how we establish the brand. So fortunately, our biggest problem is uh, you know a relatively straightforward solution, and that is keep at it and and do the little things right. I, I think that's our biggest challenge. Okay, so what about the tech side of things? How are you how are you handling that? And when I say tech both platform related and how you manage uh, your investors and your sponsors, but also in terms of digital marketing? So it's, it's a great question. You know, one of the great questions I think about crowdfunding platforms in general is, are you a tech firm or are you a real estate firm? And the, the answer is we're both. 
and, and from an integration standpoint and, and resource standpoint, we are more a real estate platform than we are a tech platform. But all of the platforms do a really good job of integrating technology into this. So there, there are some key avenues out there. I mean, Google is, is a remarkably powerful tool. And when you look at the value of Google, it, it's an impressive thing. And then when you are managing an online platform and you see Google Analytics and their ability to provide specific data feedback on what's happening on your site, you have a whole new respect and appreciation for the things that Google can accomplish. So we, uh, like a lot of our competitors, a lot of people in this space, and given that we're an online platform, it's obvious that online advertising is a prudent place for us to be spending advertising dollars. So Twitter is one place. We found that you know Twitter is, isn't necessarily the best place to attract the most relevant attention, but uh, Facebook is obviously interesting. LinkedIn is obviously interesting. Google ads are a, a part of our monthly ad spend. What we have found is that you give one of these platforms a budget, and if you don't limit it, it can take off like a rocket, and you can spend unlimited amount of money in a very short period of time. And the challenge is, of course, understanding how those are converting into actual investors. It's a little part of our of our growing investors, but that, that at least gets attention for the platform. So uh, I, I think without revealing too much information, I think that things that move, any type of a video gets gets more eyeballs. I think that LinkedIn is probably the most efficient social platform to be on, and it's impossible to ignore Google's remarketing capabilities. And then what about sourcing deals? Because it's no good, right? Having, uh, like I said, it doesn't matter if a million people come to your site if you've not got anything to offer them. So how do you, how do you source deals and, and what are you looking for actually? Uh, you know what, given the 20 years I have in the industry, uh, I have plenty of relationships that I have plenty of people asking for first real funds to help them raise money. So, you know, if, if you put, we also have on our site, you know, if, if you're interested in help and having first real fund raise money, submit a, a deal. And so we, like a lot of platforms, get to see a lot of deals that way. So what do we like is kind of one of the key questions. And this goes back to our initial conversation about, you know, handling distress in the market. We like sponsors that have experience or some, some sort of demonstrated competitive advantage. And we, there's two things we like to see. One is local expertise uh, and, and uh, at least a certain level of track record when it comes to per unit or per square foot uh, history. We also love sponsors that are in growth mode and they've, they've outgrown their current source of capital. And that frequently is friends and family or a small private equity firm where they're giving up a huge amount of the upside. We would prefer to have either a preferred or mezzanine position, but uh, and limit the upside for, for us and for our investors uh, in exchange for subordinate equity from the sponsor. So we love to be in the 60 to 80, even 85% loan to value and loan to cost. Uh, and we're willing to cap our yield in, in order for that preferred position. So when you do a stress test, you can have uh, you know, a material change in value and still have the investment position be sufficiently protected to not only have zero loss on principal, but also still, still achieve the return. But also still, still achieve the return. Are you providing loans or uh, equity? This is loans you're talking about, that. Mes- yeah, so we, mes- debt. Well, we, yep, yeah. So we're, we're comfortable doing mes- debt or, or preferred equity. And in fact, a lot, of, uh, a lot of our preferred equity looks and feels like mes but it's typically behind senior debt that prohibits a subordinate debt position. So in oh, other words, it'll, okay. it'll have a, a, fixed, a fixed rate of return and it'll have certain triggers so that there's the equivalent of a maturity date. Uh, and it'll be you know, directly behind the, the senior debt and it'll be superior to the equity from the rest of the sponsor, which is kind of like a MES loan. It's got a maturity mm-hmm. date, it's got a fixed yield, it's right behind the senior debt and there's a lot of support and equity, but it has the benefit of a lien. So there's a little bit of a, a yield differential there. It can be as tight as one or two interest rate points, so it can be as, as wide as four to even six, d- depending on sort of how high in the capital stack you're going. So then let's uh, kind of go back to our mutual experience 10 years ago and uh, look at how, how you structure the relationship. This is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit. Uh, but actually, let me start with this question. What proportion of the equity that a sponsor needs do you typically, are you typically providing? It's a great question, and it's, and it's one, you know, what, we've, what we have done in the past, and I would say what we, you know, a, a great deal for us would be 50-50. If it's a $10 million deal, and I think that's a nice middle market sort of a round number, because we're only raising one to $2 million per transaction, a 10 or 15 or $20 million deal, we're, we're still a material portion of the capital stack. 
our, our raise. So we'd love to see 50-50, right? So if it's a $10 million deal, there's a senior lender that comes in for really cheap, up to 60% loan to cost. We come in for the six to eight tranche, and then the sponsor comes in for the eight to, to 10 million, the, the, the last piece. So that's a, that's a home run deal for us. That's 50, 50. The, the maximum that we would go would be probably 80, 20, where we would provide 80% of the equity and the sponsor provides 20. So you divide 80% of the equity and the sponsor provides 20. So you do provide equity as well as mes debt or equivalent of mes debt. That's right. So it's, it's kind of the pref equity mes debt, which is, has similar characteristics. And then, and then JV equity is, a significant part of any of the aggregate commercial real estate universe. So it's it's definitely a part that we that it's definitely a, a product that we like to participate in. Okay, so now you're let's just look at the equity side of it then. So now you're willing to go up to eighty percent of the equity. But what I meant was actually that you're the only equity provider. The the sponsor is coming to you as a single source, and and any deficit. On whatever they need, they're the one that are, uh, that's bringing that in in a, in a co-invest. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, Adam, you're, I, I applaud you. You're asking really good questions. And so the answer is, unfortunately, it depends. So we love a million dollar deal. We're just not the only equity partner. We're simply right. uh, one one other limited partner amongst many others. It's it's less desirable because you're not the primary contact. You know, you're you're one of many people in in a larger pool. But sometimes for larger deals, that, that's what, you know, we'd be crazy to ignore investors' potential appetite for a really high caliber deal that's larger and, and, and has a sponsor that has a tremendous amount of experience. And, you know, otherwise investors wouldn't normally have access to that type of a deal. So we, we do do right. that. I mean, we, we do both. So, so now let's dive one layer deeper. So you said you like to be the sole partner and everything you've said kind of indicates that and the way you've described being, you know, a... a smaller partner echoes the same sentiment. So the question is, why do you like that? What is it about being the only equity partner on a deal that you like? That's a good question. It, feel, it feels better is one thing right off the bat, right? Like you're right off the bat, right? Like you're really establishing a clear relationship and it's less complicated to understand every relevant party's interests if you just have fewer people involved. I, that, that's one reason. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you what. So let me, let me just kind of, uh, you know, I've tried to, I try not to put words into anybody's mouth, but I do have something <laughs> that's kind of top of mind and it's Bring not it fair that, uh, but the reason that I'm really getting at this is that when you're the only investor, does that give you the uh, negotiating edge when it comes to the offering documents? And do you exercise that edge? If you like, do you negotiate the terms differently? So is that why you yeah. like it? At the end of well, the day? that's yeah. You know, unfortunately, you know that that's, that's a right. huge advantage, right? Like that's when you're op when you're negotiating either a loan doc or the the operating agreement, you're the only party that's involved. If if you're one of fifty joint venture equity partners, you're signing the doc, you're signing the docs as is more than likely ninety percent ninety nine percent of the time. Okay, so what are you looking for in those contracts? Kind of the key things, the relationship with the sponsor. Well, so. This is a level of expertise that you don't get as an analyst. You don't even really get as, as any type of just a real estate person. You really have to have entity level experience or executive experience, and you have to have access to lawyers. So this is a, a, a really hard question to answer because it just varies so much. It can vary by state. It varies by region. It varies by asset class. But inevitably, there's a few key things, which is ultimately your question. And yeah. you, you always want the, the control provisions to be favorable for you. And, and you, you want to treat your co-investor, your sponsor, with fairness. And you also want them to treat you fair. So if they make mistakes, if something happens that's beyond their control, the ability for you to execute your workout plan, and this is relevant, you know, living through 2008 to 2008 to 2012 was really relevant for, for me and, and certainly for you because we learned to address and how, how important some of these terms are. And the market has evolved since then, and some of the terms have become more clear and some a little bit less clear. But 
the best way to summarize it is you want to be able to take control of any property without too much hassle. With, and, and sometimes, frankly, being in a preferred position is easier than being in a MES position because foreclosure is, is a terribly long process. And sometimes simply the threat of foreclosure is your greatest asset when it comes to that. So if you're in a preferred position and there's a series of provisions that allow the, the sponsor or require the sponsor to hand control over to you as the sole co-investor, that's a really powerful position to be in. So that's 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 a top of mind when it comes to negotiating okay. stocks. What would you say? Okay. You tell me. You're, you're talking to the lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it basically. I think it's really ultimately it's the right to be able to be able to veto anything. I think at mm. the highest level, right? You've got to be able to. You see the the discussion that I've been having, and, and let's come back to this because I would like to ask the relationship now that you have with investors. And how do, how do you bring investors, crowd investors into your deals? Because by the way, I think what you've described is of absolute critical importance to long-term success. You're only a year old, but I think you should have extreme confidence that you have the potential for substantial longevity based on what you've just told me. And this is after having spoken to just about everybody else in the industry, right? So let me make that clear. <laughs> I really applaud what you're doing. But the key thing, yeah, is definitely the ability to be able to protect your interests as an investor, right? So if things do go south or if the sponsor starts to do things that you don't like, you've got to have to, to protect your investment. I mean, at the end of the day, that's it. So that's, that's the key thing. So let me ask you about the relationship now that you have with investors. How do investors come in and how do they benefit from the rights and remedies that you have now negotiated with your sponsors? So consistent with almost every platform in the space, we create a specific entity. And so that entity is managed by First Real Fund. And so they are benefiting from the real estate expertise that we have, first and foremost. Uh, but second of all, this goes back to the co-investment, right? Like I, I think that the obvious benefit of a co-investment is the original underwriting. We're not underwriting these just to see if it works or not and how big our fees can be. We're underwriting these as investors. And the other thing is, as you and I both know, Things happen during an investment term, so it's, it's entirely impossible to predict what might and might not happen. So um, they are relying, investors are relying on us or, or whoever, would, whoever would take over control of the entity to execute whatever plan becomes most relevant in order to maximize recovery. And there is an infinite number of potential resolutions to this, but when you've got your own skin in the game, more than likely, especially as you know, we, <laughs> we like to consider ourselves relatively advanced commercial real estate executives, we're going to make decisions based on what we think is going to be the maximum recovery in the shortest amount of time. So they benefit from from our expertise in our, in our relationships, and you know what? There's there's pros to being passive investors, and there's cons to being passive investors. But and, and we haven't really talked about this. But what is the fundamental advantage of all of the crowdfunding platforms? And you know, we are stewards of investors' capital, and we certainly want to represent to investors that we're doing everything we can to prevent them with present them with interesting opportunities. But the opportunities have risk, and there is a risk to these opportunities that isn't available really with any other product. There's also a reward that isn't available with any product. There's also a reward that isn't available with any other product. So managing that balance is really sort of the magic in, in the sauce that I don't think everybody always discusses, but is, is top of mind for us. So what are the biggest challenges that you find at the moment? Is it, is it in finding investors? Is it, are you finding that the investors that you have are test driving you and that they've invested in, on other platforms or are they completely new to the game? Are you having to educate them as, you know, what's a mortgage? <laughs> I, teach this, I teach this course at, at Cal Poly to, to fourth year students. I mean, these are bright bright kids and it didn't occur to me until I first started doing it that you know you've got to start at the beginning actually you've even said this mm -hmm. that people you've got to know something extremely well in order to be able to explain it extremely simply right and if you make it easy to understand but what's the educational process you find for investors is it deal based or is it real estate or is it platform one of the challenges for us is the educating investors and frankly sometimes the more sophisticated investors ask harder questions 
and and the net result is a, is a longer phone call, right? I've had it's it's not uncommon to have 30 minute, 45 minute, even hour long phone calls with investors. Now, sometimes it's an investor that does start with what's a mortgage, and and they're a doctor and they're very curious about you know real estate and the risks and rewards. So that's that's a very specific type of conversation. And then you have you know former real estate executives that have owned real estate in the past and they want to leverage their underwriting expertise, sometimes market intel to continue to make a profit on that knowledge. And so they come in and they start asking in the operating agreement. And what about the, and so that's just as long, if not even a more difficult conversation. So what ends up happening is the, the, the time commitment to bringing an investor on board for right now as a new platform is, is one of the challenges. Now, statistically true for us and generally, uh, you know, taken in the market, once an investor dip their toes in, on average, it's another seven deals that they'll ultimately participate in. So it's a worthwhile endeavor. So our challenge is any startup, bringing on board quality long-term investors is a labor-intensive but fun and, frankly, rewarding process. So I'll, I'll run with that as one of our challenges. What's your deal flow like? Is that also challenging? I mean, that's very time consuming, right? Because you've got to underwrite these things. You know, uh, I have too many deals and I spent too much of my career, I, I would argue, underwriting these deals. So we have, man, we have, we have some really, really interesting deals. And we have, you know, one of the things that we really want to be a part of is we want to have a range, right? We want to have the preferred equity and JV equity. We want to have MES deals, which is one of our deals now. We want to have senior debt deals. One of the unique products that we think is going to be interesting as the market evolves, it's going to potentially mirror what's happened in the CMBS world where we can take and crowdfund a B piece in a senior note. And that B piece has the benefit of extra yield, but you also have, you're on, on board with a senior lender that has legal and asset management and servicing expertise that you know, you know, the typical crowdfunding platform doesn't have. So there's just a, an unlimited amount of potential products that we would love to be having. You know, we, eventually, we will have on the site, but you know, today they're not. So all of those are – I've got those deals knocking on the door. We've got value-add deals oh, knocking on the door. Yeah, we're, there's no shortage of deals. And a time horizon for deals is typically how long you like to see maturity? You know, generally, three years is as long as we'd like to go. We have a JV equity deal up now that's four years. That would be the longest. Two years or less is really a sweet spot. It gives us an opportunity to – investors don't have too long of a commitment. And, and there's, you know, there's an interesting concept that we haven't really fully touched on in full detail yet, but where we are in the investment cycle is uh, a c part of the conversation for a lot of, a lot of investors and, and certainly for us as well. So a two-year investment horizon gives everybody a little bit of comfort. So yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Where do you think we are in the, I mean, I can kind of yeah. guess. Uh, what, talk about that for a minute. Where do you think we are in the, I mean, I can kind yeah. of guess uh, what uh, your answer is going to be, but where do you think we are and what do you think it's going to look like? I know you're going to love uh, ask me asking you for a prediction, but if you get it right, you'll be a genius. And if you don't you know, remember anyway, so it'd be fine. Well, we could do a whole podcast on this topic as well. I'm curious what you think, what you, what you think I'll say. Uh, well, if you're thinking a two-year horizon, I'm guessing that you are sympathetic to the Fed's view that we've got a, a, you know, another three years to go, <laughs> right? That's a fair assessment. But I will, I will make this observation. And I, I'm licensed with, with North Capital, and, and so I – you know, I'm not authorized to make any recommendations to anybody, so I need to make sure that nobody's listening and thinking okay. that I'm offering advice. Because I'm not. <laughs> okay, right. Oh, I see. Right, right. Okay, sure. So I think that there's a lot of people that love to discuss, and there's a lot of media outlets that love to put up clicks to, you know, we're at the end of the easy, relatively easy to forget just how tumultuous 2008, 9, and 10 were. Uh, there was li – liquidity was, was a problem, and it's not very many times in history, and typically – not very many times in most people's lifetime that we have a crisis of, of liquidity like that. So I also see a lot of investors that looking around are looking at um, how easy it would be to be an investor as though it were 2010, right? Like anybody could invest in almost anything, especially in commercial real estate in 2010 and make an awful lot of money. That's not the case today. So there's a uh, longing for the good old days when in fact it was remarkably painful I, my, my sense is sometimes when I see people, oh boy, you know, we're, we're at the really end of the cycle, or when you look at their position, they would be really happy to have a 2010 environment where they could buy up a lot of stuff at, at really cheap prices. So I, I don't know how much time we have, but I also continually see, and I just was looking at Real Estate Alert, baby, you raised another $2 billion to do small, $2 billion to do small balance commercial real estate loans. The largest private equity firms 
are, are raising an unprecedented, unprecedented amount of capital. So it's difficult to ignore that reality. There's billions of dollars, really, really smart money that's, con that's being raised with fairly specific strategies. And, and these guys admittedly are not going after Class A product in major metro areas. They are looking, just like we are, at niches that are compelling. So that might be smaller deals. That might be deals in secondary markets. That might be smaller sponsors. There's no question that value add and bridge lending is something that's compelling, which is exactly the type of product that we're going for. Measuring all this by headlines and, and opinions, I think, can be a, a dangerous thing. And I think measuring everything by dollar amount can also be a dangerous thing. But if you just look at where's the money going, we're, the, the money's assuming that we're, there's still a lot of room to run. So there's a couple of ways of defending right against a cycle against a cycle coming to an end. One is to play the short game, but another way is to look at significantly longer term, right? And if you're dealing with, I'm guessing if you're dealing with family offices and you're dealing with a family office out of Australia or any others, and based on your experience anyway, that you know that their view is multi-generational. So cycles are less important. Do you have any inclination like this time next year, will, be, will you be looking at one-year terms? And in two years' time, then what? Right? If the market's still going up. So at what point do you start to think longer term and look at deals that maybe never have an exit but produce yield on a, on a stable long-term basis? Is that something that you, you, you can see your company moving towards? Is that just not the market that you're in? And the, uh, the, the brilliant thing about commercial real estate is creativity. A bit. Two years from now, you think taking a 10-year position, which is what a lot of senior lenders, that, that's their loan term, going into CMBS would be a really smart thing. There will be common. and there are still some. There's options to hedge a position. We, want to, we have the ability to offer a certain product to investors. And as I mentioned before, there is a risk and reward position. And some investors are going to have a portfolio that really need a little bit more risk. And some investors are going to want to have a portfolio that don't need a lot more risk or already have too much real estate exposure. How these crowdfunding offerings fit into a certain investor's portfolio, it, it, it's a really great way to sort of to switch things up. So there, it's <laughs> it's a very hard thing to answer, but it is a really interesting thing to think about because there's so many ways to be creative about it. As we get to the, uh, as each investor sort of forms an opinion, it sounds, you know, there's no question your students are aware of this. There's no question that, that the people that, you know, as as you talk to the other crowdfunding platforms and, and the private equity firms, people are constantly evolving aware of this. There's no question that the, the people that, you know, as as you talk to the other crowdfunding platforms and, and the private equity firms, people are constantly evolving where they think we are. All right, Dan, so where do you think, what, what do you think the impact of regulatory changes are going to be on capital formation for the real estate industry? Or put another way, what do you think the impact of crowdfunding is going to be on real estate? Uh, hard question, Adam. In, in the short term, at the end of the day, this industry isn't going to have a massive impact on the, the real estate industry. Five years from now, it will probably have enough traction that people will be forced to take notice. And I think that 10 years from now, this will be a very unique avenue for the crowd to voice their opinion in what's happening in the markets. So uh, one of the really cool things about this role, and, and I hope it's the same for you talking to all of us, is that as I talk to all these investors, I'm getting data input from a really broad array of people that are interested in this space. And they don't just, as they tell me these things, they also vote with dollars, right? There's actual data points that we can measure and, and understand and you know, realize what's interesting. And while that's evident to me on, in my day-to-day -day basis, it's not evident to the rest of the, of the world yet. But so I think that the, the regulators have done a remarkable job of positioning this uh, in, in a place that can grow. They've done a remarkable job of making sure that the industry is regulated to prevent unnecessary trouble. Uh, and at this point, it's just a matter of growth and adoption by, by the market. So my first question is, as a real estate guy, what are the key daily habits that you have that make you and your business successful? I'll, I'll go with three. Uh, the first is you, you've got to read the news. Uh, re whatever is compelling for you, whatever news aggregator or whatever sort of alternative, whether it's a hobby or whether it's exercise. But for me, it's exercise and it is a range of exercise. So it's not just doing the same thing every day, but it's doing three or four different types of exercise. 
it, it, it helps as a distraction and it helps the mind function in a high performance environment. And that sort of ties into the third. I think that everybody, uh, a, a remarkable, this is a really complex industry and a commitment to excellence is essentially paramount. And, and it, it exhibits itself not just in the vision of being, oh, we're going to be really fantastic, but it's actually a commitment to excellence in the little things and the details. That's my uh, daily habits. Right. So my second question, what has been the hardest lesson that you've learned in real estate? As a, as a young person, one of the things is, that's hard to learn is you have to prioritize based on what you're trying to accomplish. And, and in some instances, what you're trying to accomplish is fees. If, if you're a lender and you need to generate revenue, then you need to make sure that you're working on deals that generate fees and prioritize. If you need to generate revenue, then you need to make sure that you're working on deals that generate fees and prioritize those deals and fees. Young students, I think, when I was a young student, I came out and was exposed to a lot of different concepts and a lot of different hopes and dreams, but I didn't necessarily have the reality of uh, hard-earned dollars being a priority in, in one's life. So that, that was a lesson. I think the hardest lesson for executives sometimes mm -hmm. to learn is persistence. A, a key part of a lot of, uh, of any real estate deal is the deal falls apart. And when you're working towards a goal that has to have a lot of different pieces align, you have to remain persistent. And it's, it's a hard lesson to know that you've just put weeks of, of effort into making a deal happen and then it doesn't. That doesn't mean that the story's over. Stick with it. Very good. Okay. And so now the last question. If you could give one piece of advice to somebody who has not yet invested in real estate online but is considering investing in real estate online – but is considering investing, what would that advice be? Have the courage to call whatever whatever the counterparty is and ask the dumb question. Whether you're new to this or whether you're sophisticated, there's probably a question that's nagging you and it might seem like you don't need to ask it or it's a dumb question. Call, get on the phone with people. There's no better way to establish a relationship. And everybody in this industry is more than happy to help. So, so call and ask the dumb question. Dan summarizes what to look for in offering documents by emphasizing the power to be able to take control of any property without too much hassle in the event that it would be desirable to do that. Obviously, no one goes into a deal expecting to take over from a sponsor, and a sponsor shouldn't be concerned that that is the motivation of investors. Investors typically do want to remain passive, but they don't necessarily want to be passive under all answers. It's important to have some veto rights, if you like, or at least some rights involving some of the major decisions in a deal, or before going into the deal, at least knowing that you do not have those rights. Okay, So it's a good thing to know what to look for. What are those trigger points to be looking for in the offering documents so that you can find them and at least know what the landscape looks like before you get into the deal. As I mentioned before, this is exactly where I start my due diligence on a deal. It's to look at the offering documents to determine what kinds of rights and remedies I have in the deal. And so if you're as concerned about preserving the principle that you invest as I am and as Dan is, then register for the webcast that I put together based on conversations with three eminent attorneys that covers exactly this topic. Just go to the show notes page for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website or NREforum.org website or NREforum.org forward slash first real fund. My next guest is Lynn Smith of Buy the Block. Buy the Block is one of the very few funding portals, actually, that are set up under regulation crowdfunding or Reg CF under the Jobs Act of 2012. Lynn is a member of and regulated by FINRA. Right? So, you know, that's a tough task that she's taken on. And she can sell deals to accredited and non-accredited investors alike. It's a very arduous process to be a Reg CF funding portal. And I'm sure you'll find Lynn's story of really great interest. Be sure not to miss that episode by subscribing to the series at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting any of the links that I've included about halfway down the homepage. Thanks for tuning in and thanks also to Dan Drew of First Real Fund for sharing your time.